Hi everybody, welcome back. In this video of our series about electric potential and electric field, we are going to discuss capacitance and capacitors. And I have a lot for you here, so hopefully you can stay tuned. Now capacitance is defined as the ability to store electric charge. It has the capacity to store charge. Something that has a higher capacitance will be able to store more charge under the same amount of electric potential difference, that is the same voltage, than something with lower capacitance. And generally in real electric circuits, a lot of times when you're really trying to have a big current flowing, you're going to want to be storing a lot of charge. So the idea of a capacitor is that the capacitor needs to get charged somehow. It needs to get charged through some sort of electromotive force. In other words, something like a battery or a wall outlet or something like that. The idea is that the battery is doing work by separating charges from one electric plate and moving them to the other electric plate through the process of the chemical reactions. And as this happens, you eventually end up reaching a point of equilibrium where there is a maximum amount of charge that is stored on each plate, and that will be equal to the charge of the battery. Now, the exact rate at which this happens is something that we will look at in more detail in a future unit. But for now, what we care about is the fact that there are capacitors that can store electric charge, and you charge them by setting electric potential differences to their two ends. So how long it takes? Sometimes it can take microseconds. Sometimes it can take a number of seconds. Sometimes it can take longer than that, depending on the capacitor and elements of the circuit itself, like the resistors and stuff like that. Now, how does this work? We've already come across capacitors before in our analysis of electric fields of infinite sheets and then imagining two oppositely charged infinite sheets close to each other and the fact that in between the electric field would be very strong and outside the electric field would be zero. So recall that the electric field due to, an, due to a capacitor is simply equal to the charge density on each plate divided by epsilon naught. And keep in mind that that was, that was found by the fact that each plate itself contributes an eta over two epsilon naught to the electric field and they're obviously charged plates. So in between, they add up, outside, they cancel. So again, the charge density is the charge per unit area. So here was that picture again, for those of you who have forgotten it. Um, up here we have the field due to the positive plate. Up here, down here, we have the field due to the negative plate, and again, in between the plates, those end up adding together. Again, the positive plate's on the left, so it forces positive charges away from it. The negative plate's on the right, so it pulls positive charges toward it. Inside, that contributes to a net, a net field to the right. Outside, contributes to cancellation. Now, the amount of charge on the capacitor uh, remember, it's eta over epsilon naught, so eta being Q over A. Uh, that's something you can either remember or just understand, remembering that the electric field was eta over epsilon naught, where epsilon naught was the primitivity of free space, about 8.854 times 10 to the minus 12 coulomb squared per newton meter squared. Well, also remember that the potential difference between two plates that have a roughly constant electric field between them is given by delta V equals E times D. Delta V equals Ed, at least in terms of the magnitude. But E, as we just have up here, is Q over epsilon naught A. So just plugging that in and performing a little bit of rearrangement and solving for that Q, we have that Q is related to the electric potential difference. Now, considering the fact that capacitance is defined as charge per unit electric potential difference, we see an expression right here. We, we have extracted an expression here for the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor. It's just epsilon naught A over D, where A is the area of each plate and D is the separation distance between the plates. So that's pretty cool, isn't it? In fact, in general, capacitance is always defined as the charge per unit voltage, that is the charge per unit electric potential difference, that must be memorized.
capacitance is charge per unit voltage. And as such, therefore, Q equals C delta V. The units of capacitance are called farads. It's given by the symbol capital F where a farad is one coulomb per volt. Now, I'll tell you right now, a farad is a very large unit of capacitance. So you, you don't want to be fooling around with capacitors that have capacitances of one farad and trying to charge them up to high levels of volt of electric potential. So in any case, um, regardless of the configuration, if you have a parallel plate capacitor, you get that the capacitance is epsilon naught A over D. So that is the capacitance. And again, that should be memorized. Now, in general, you won't necessarily have a vacuum between your capacitor plates. If you have some material between your capacitor plates, something that has a dielectric constant that isn't the same as that of the vacuum, then this epsilon naught will be different. It won't be epsilon naught, it'll be epsilon, and it won't be equal to 8.854 times to the minus 12 coulomb square per newton meter squared. It'll be something different. That's something that we're going to get to later in this unit. Now, what if it's not a parallel plate capacitor? Because in the real world, capacitors will often be cylindrical shape, so cylindrically shaped, or shaped like spheres or something like that. So, um, cylindrical shapes are often especially effective because what you can do is you can take two parallel plates, separate them with some dielectric material that is non-conducting material, and then roll it up. And then you'll have a device that can have quite a large capacitance just in a relatively small space. So we'll discuss that later, as I already mentioned. But let's at least analyze how this would be for some other shapes of capacitors um, as we go through this um, discussion. So first, let's consider a long cylindrical capacitor of length L in which the positively charged inner cylinder, cylinder has radius A and the negatively charged outer cylindrical shell has a radius of B, an inner radius of B at least. Calculate the capacitance of this. Hmm, seems intimidating. Well, hopefully it won't seem intimidating on the AP exam because there's, I mean, this is a common type of problem on the AP exam. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to assume that the cylindrical setup is effectively infinitely long and that we're looking down the axis of it. So we're looking down the axis of this as an inner radius, the radius of the inner part is A, the inner radius of the outer part is B. And it's important the fact that the, these are conductors. The, these are conducting surfaces in here. And in this problem, we're going to assume that there's nothing in between the two surfaces. It's just a vacuum. So here's the general idea in calculating capacitances of setups like this, whether it's a cylinder, whether it's a sphere, or even whether it's a parallel plate capacitor just with some other material between the plates. We use the definition of capacitance, and we also use Gauss's law, and we also use integration. We use Gauss's law to come up with an expression for the electric field. We use integration to come up with an expression for the electric potential difference between the plates. And then we use the definition of capacitance to say, okay, Given a charge, divide by that electric potential difference. Hopefully the charges end up canceling. They always do. And therefore, you get your capacitance. Let's see how that goes here. So we're going to use Gauss's law to obtain the electric field. So don't forget Gauss's law. If you've forgotten Gauss's law, then make sure to go back to all of the Unit 2 uh, PowerPoint videos. So Gauss's law is that the closed integral of e vector dot dA vector is equal to the enclosed charge over epsilon naught. Well, this is a, uh, I guess you could call parallel cylinder capacitor. So the area of an imaginary Gaussian surface of length L and radius R is going to be 2 pi RL, and that's radius little r, just some arbitrary radial coordinate as we see in this diagram. And 
the enclosed charge, if you're inside of the capacitor, which you'd better be because it's where it's meaningful, is just going to be equal to, well, however much charge is in that cylinder. Well, the idea here is now we have an expression for the electric field equal to 2kq over RL, or again, lowercase q is the amount of charge in the cylinder. And we're going to get our electric potential difference by integrating this. Now, you might be wondering, it's like, are we actually going to calculate that charge in the cylinder? It turns out that we don't need to. Because remember, in the end, we're going to be calculating a capacitance. And remember, capacitance is charge per unit potential difference, charge per unit voltage. So here we're already seeing some good signs, the fact that we have this charge in our expression, and maybe it'll end up helping us to cancel it out. Let's find out. So integrate this. So delta V is the negative integral of E vector dot ds vector, but here we're just integrating with respect to the radial coordinates, so we can get rid of all that dot product nonsense and just integrate from R equals B to R equals A. So the idea, the reason we're integrating from B to A is because this is the direction in which the electric field is increasing. So if we integrate from B to A, that's going to end up giving us a positive electric potential difference. If we got a negative, we would just slap a positive sign in front of it in, in any case, because capacitance by definition is always positive. But still, it, it's nice to do things cleanly. So we're going in the direction of increasing electric field, or sorry, of increasing electric potential. In other words, we're going against the electric field. So that's going to give us a positive delta V. So let's see how that works out for us. Well, notice I've already gotten rid of a negative sign. Did you see that? We have it right here. But look in this other integral here. I got rid of the negative sign. What happened? Ah, sneaky, sneaky, sneaky. I switched the integration bounds and absorbed the minus sign to make the integral easier. So now I don't have to worry about these double negatives because we don't do no double negatives. So we plug in our expression for the electric field, the 2kq over RL. Do kq over L comes out of the integral. We just integrate dr over r. That's natural log r. r is always positive, so I don't worry about any absolute value bars. And plugging in the bounds, we have 2kq over L times the quantity natural log b minus natural log a. But you'd better combine those because natural log has to be dimensionless. a and b have dimensions, so that'll be natural log of b over a. So there's our expression for the electric potential difference. 2kq over L times natural log of b over a. Woohoo! Now, what about the capacitance? The capacitance is charge per unit voltage. Well, that's Q divided by this expression that has a Q in it. So the Qs divide out. And the denominator of a denominator becomes a numerator. That's what just happened to this L. Nothing happens to the natural log. That's an entirely separate expression. So that stays in the denominator. So our capacitance for this capacitor is L over 2k lin b over a, where b is the radi inner radius of the outer cylinder, and a is the radius of the inner cylinder, and k is the 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. So, pretty cool, huh? We found the capacitance of a, a cylindrical capacitor. Spherical capacitors will be left as homework problems. So, but yeah, notice that we have a variety of capacitors here, and a number of these are in a cylindrical shape. And some of them, in fact, generally speaking, um, most capacitors that you're going to deal with, at least the ones that have cylindrical shapes, will have their capacitances on the side. See, this one, 4,700 microfarads. That's 4.7 millifarads. That's a lot of capacitance. The, this thing has the capacity to store a lot of charge. And notice it also has voltage rating. If you try going over that, that's going to be bad. You're going to get magic blue smoke. So, trivial example, calculate how much charge that large blue capacitor can hold when charged to the maximum voltage rating. Well, I mentioned it had a capacitance of 4,700 microfarads, and it can go up to 35 volts. Well, capacitance is charge per unit voltage, so charge is capacitance times voltage. So that thing can actually store 0.16 coulombs of charge. Wow! That is a lot of charge. 
you might wonder why does that charge not end up just repelling itself and causing the whole thing to explode? I mean, KQ over R squared, that thing looked pretty small. It's probably on the order of a few centimeters. So, like, just split that charge into into half, so and just round. So just say that each part has 0.1 coulombs, so that's 0.01 times 10 to the 9 for the coulomb constant, so 10 to the 7 divided by the separation distance on the order of a centimeter squared. So 10 to the 7th divided by 0.01 squared, that's 10 to the 11 newtons. That's a huge amount of force. So why isn't this thing just exploding? The answer is because it's not just 0.16 coulombs of positive charge. It's 0.16 coulombs of positive and negative charge. And those help to cancel each other out and prevent embarrassing explosions. So, but yeah, that is a potentially deadly amount of charge, so you would need to be very careful when you're trying to discharge this. Make sure that you don't get any of your little fingers stuck in between. So, this is also why you need to be really careful to ground electronics even after they're unplugged, um, because there could still be large amounts of charge stored in the capacitors. So, something else to keep in mind is that batteries can generate thousands of coulombs of charge, but they do so very slowly, otherwise they would just end up exploding, and um, that would be bad. So. Car batteries, though, which have a very low internal resistance, can actually discharge very fast if you short-circuit them. So that's something you definitely don't want to do. Um, the story I often tell is that when my dad was younger, he accidentally dropped a wrench between the terminals of a, couple of a car battery, and he said that the wrench almost instantly glowed white hot. So, yeah, don't, don't do that. So, but generally speaking, batteries discharge rather slowly. So if you want something to give you a lot of charge very quickly, you need a capacitor. The flash bulbs on cameras are charged with a battery, but the charge is stored in a capacitor. So when you need the flash, um, that charge is discharged very quickly through the bulb, but because of the fact that you need to recharge it and that recharging process is slow, you can't take a whole bunch of flash pictures all at once. Uh, most computer keyboards use capacitor switches for the keys. Pressing a key pushes two capacitor plates closer together, increasing their capacitance. And since a larger capacitor can hold more charge, there will therefore be a current um, carrying charge from the battery or power supply to that capacitor. And that current can be detected, and therefore the keystroke is recorded. A defibrillator has a large capacitor storing up to 360 joules of energy, which is released in about 2 milliseconds. So that is 1 500th of a second. So I'm um, just multiplying 360 by 500 to get the power there. Well, 360 by 500 multiplied by 500, that's the same thing as 180 times 1,000. So that would be 180,000 watts. It's over 9,000! 180,000! Unbelievable! Yeah, that's a lot of power. So there's your defibrillator. Of course, it only does this for a very short period of time, but enough energy is discharged that it can potentially start a heart pumping again, or at least correct an incorrectly or irregularly pumping heartbeat. Now, capacitors can be placed in various arrangements and circuits. Here's a situation where the capacitors are placed in parallel. And there's, I, I intentionally did this so that they are not all geometrically parallel, but the idea is the charge could come from the 6-volt battery. It either goes to the 20 microfarad capacitor or through the 5 microfarad capacitor or through the 4 microfarad capacitor. But either orbit, yeah, this is parallel. Well, how can we figure out the capacitance of this sort of thing? Well, we will apply Kirchhoff's loop rule. So first, any loop starting on one capacitor and going through another capacitor back and, and then back through the first must have a potential difference of zero. So in other words, let's just consider this middle loop. If I have, um, just consider a loop from the bottom of the 20 microfarad capacitor going up here through the 5 microfarad and then back through the 20, back to where we started, 
that potential difference has got to be zero. Well, the only way that can happen, I mean, the wires don't really have any significant potential difference. They're conductors, after all. The only way this can happen is if each capacitor has the same potential difference. So the potential difference across the 20 microfarad capacitor is the same as the potential difference across the 5, and for that matter, the same as the potential difference across the 4. So they all have the same electric potential difference. Second, any loop starting from the battery and going through any of the other arms and then back through the battery also must have delta V equals zero. So that means that each capacitor is charged to the same potential difference as the battery, which in this case is six volts. So what that means is that in any loop, the, uh, the EMF, so to speak, uh, is six volts from the battery. So in any loop, the total is zero. So the electric potential difference across um, capacitor one is just that for the battery. Same for the electric potential difference across capacitors two and three. Let's say capacitor one is the 20 microfarad one, capacitor two is the five microfarad one, capacitor three is the four microfarad one. Okay, well, remember, capacitance is charge per unit voltage, but that means that the potential difference across each capacitor is the charge on that capacitor divided by its capacitance. But all the voltages are the same. They're just script E, which is the symbol I'm giving for the electric potential difference of the battery. So the, voltage are all, the voltages are all script E. So therefore, if we're trying to calculate the equivalent capacitance for this entire circuit, that would be the total charge that's stored. Of course, by total charge, I'm talking about the magnitude of the total charge, um, because after all, each plate, each capacitor has one positive plate and the other negative plate of equal magnitude. But in any case, the magnitude of the charge difference on each capacitor compared with zero, well, the total charge is just the sum of each of those charges divided by the electric potential difference. But it's all the same, so it's just script D, script D, script D. But each of these expressions here, Q1 over script D, well, that's the capacitance of capacitor 1. Q2 over script D, well, that's the capacitance of capacitor 2. Q3 of script, over script D is the capacitance of capacitor 3. In other words, the equivalent capacitance of capacitors that are set up in series is always, or sorry, in parallel, in parallel, this is a parallel circuit. The equivalent capacitance for capacitors that are set up in parallel is always equal to the sum of the individual capacitances. So that's something, that's one of the other things that you just need to remember. Sure, you can derive it anytime you need it, but it's a better idea just to remember it. And this will work for more than just three. So whenever you have capacitors that are in parallel, the equivalent capacitance is just the sum of the individual capacitances. So, again, we got that by Kirchhoff's loop rule. So, let's say we have this setup here, just capacitors with capacitances of 25 and 4 microfarads in parallel. What's the equivalent capacitance? Well, using our higher level arithmetic skills, we add together 20 plus 5 plus 4, and we get 29 microfarads for the equivalent capacitance in that particular circuit that we've been dealing with the whole time. What about capacitors in series? This is a pure series circuit. First the charge would go through, um, or at least get separated from one, then the next, then the next. So this is a series circuit. So here's the idea. First you'd hit the 20, going from the 6 volt battery, then you'd hit the 5, then you'd hit the 4 microfarad capacitor. So what is the equivalent capacitance of this thing? Would it just be adding up the numbers again, just like we did when they were in parallel? So using Kirchhoff's loop rule, we have that script E minus the potential difference on capacitor 1, minus the voltage for capacitor 2, minus voltage across capacitor 3, has got to be zero. That's the loop rule. In fact, I, I should have been a good physics student and written sum of delta Vs equals zero. Therefore, script E minus V1 minus V2 minus 3V equals zero. So I took a shortcut here that you should not take. You should start off with the loop rule in general. So in any case, this is where we're at so far. 
But in this case, we also only have one loop, but each of the voltage drops is potentially different. So you can kind of think of this literally like a battery and a lock uh, where we're talking about the locks that are used to raise the water in a canal. So the battery acts like a lock and then each of the capacitors or resistors, whatever the case may be, acts like a waterfall. So we have a series of waterfalls here with our capacitors. And the analogy there is that each waterfall is like a change in height. In other words, a change in gravitational potential. And here, it's a change in electric potential. The wires themselves are um, neutral, I should mention. And that is an important fact. Going back to this picture, what is connecting this negative plate on the right side of the 20 microfarad capacitor with the positive plate at the bottom side of the 5 microfarad capacitor. It's a wire. But what is the total charge on the wire? The total charge on the wire is zero. Well, if the total charge on this wire is zero, by the same logic, the total charge on this wire has got to be zero. What does that mean? It means that however much charge this battery moved from the positive plate ends up going to the negative plate over here. That's really what, what the battery ended up doing. But if the total charge here on the wire is zero, then that means that since the you're going to have the opposite charge on the other plate of the battery, that means that the opposite charge from that must be on this plate of the capacitor. Sorry, I said battery. I meant to say capacitor. And since the opposite charge of that must be on this plate of the capacitor, then the opposite charge of that must be on the other plate of the capacitor. Because again, the wire is neutral. What that tells us is that every capacitor in series is charged to the same charge. If I have three microcoulombs on one capacitor, all the other capacitors that are in that series have three microcoulombs on them. So if you didn't quite get that argument, then maybe pause the video and rewind a little bit and go back through it again. But it all has to do with the combination of the fact that whatever charge is on one plate of the capacitor must be the opposite of what's on the other plate. And because the wire has zero charge total, then the opposite of that must be at the other end of the wire, and thus the, the plate of the next capacitor, etc. So we have multiple voltage drops, but each one has the same amount of charge. So that's something we're going to keep in mind. So let's see how this is going to end up working in this problem. So Q1 equals Q2 equals Q3. So again, we have script E minus V1 minus V2 minus V3 equals zero. But remember, capacitance is charge per unit voltage. So that means that voltage is charge divided by capacitance. So V1 is Q1 over C1. V2 is Q2 over C2. V3 is Q3 over C3. Oh, but wait a second. Q1, Q2, and Q3 are all the same because of the argument that we just laid out. So we can just call that Q and factor it out. There it is. I factored it out. Yay. Well, what is capacitance again? Capacitance is charge per unit voltage. So I divide my I just take capacitance and say charge divided by delta V. But charge divided by delta V, well, here's my delta V. That's just script E. There's my charge. So I'm going to just isolate for Q over script E. So I'm going to divide both sides by script E. I'm going to divide both sides by my thing in parentheses, which is the sum of the inverses. So apparently the equivalent capacitance, which is charge over script E, is equal to the inverse of the sum of the inverses. Or, stating it differently, the inverse of the equivalent capacitance in series is equal to the sum of the inverses. So, how does that work for this example? How do we calculate this? Well, um, doing it the slow way, 
we would find a common denominator. Oh, I know a common denominator between 20 and 5 and 4. That's 20. So I'll write it that way. And doing so gives us different numerators, which add together to get 10. So 1 over C is 10 over 20, or 1 over 2 microfarads. So the equivalent capacitance itself ends up being 2 microfarads. So in summary so far, equivalent capacitance of parallel capacitors, capacitors in parallel, is just equal to the sum of the individual capacitances. The equivalent capacitance for capacitors in series is given by the fact that the inverse of the equivalent capacitance is equal to the sum of the inverses. Now notice that you can't just add together 20 plus 5 plus 4 and get 29 and invert that, because after all, um, one if each one was 2, a half plus a half is 1, and 1 over that is 1. But um, if we tried to add together 2 plus 2, we would get 4, and if we inverted that, we'd get a fourth, and it would be completely wrong. So you have to add together the inverses separately together, mm -hmm. and then all together, and then invert the result. Now, there's a shortcut for this particular problem. Here's the shortcut. Notice that number 20. What are the factors of 20? Well, 5 times 2 times 2. No. The factors of 20 that we care about are that it's 5 times 4. Here's the trick. Whenever you have, um, whenever you're adding together inverses, when one of the numbers in the denominator of the sum is equal to a product of successive integers, in this case 20 is 4 times 5, successive integers 4 and 5, if the next number in that sum, or if one of the other numbers in that sum, is equal to the higher of the two successive integers, mm -hmm. then because of that whole common denominator thing, the overall sum is equal to the lower of the successive integers. In other words, 1 over 20 plus 1 over 5 is equal to 1 over 4. If it was 1 over 72 plus 1 over 9, it would be 1 over 8. However, it doesn't work the other way, of course. 1 over 72 plus 1 over 8 needs to be less than 1 over 8. Um, so, or actually, uh, it needs to be greater than 1 over 8, that is. So it's the number in the denominator is going to be like 7 point something. But, yeah, if it's successive integers and then the higher of those two, the sum is going to be the lower of those two. So the 20 and the 5 make a 4. And then the 4 and the 4, you see how that ended up splitting up? That became a 2. So if it was a 72 and a 9, that would have given us an 8. So if this circuit had been 72, 9, and 8, the 72 and 9 would give 8, the 8 and the 8 would give 4. Uh, how, about, how about another one? What if it was a... Hmm, what if it was a 42 and a 7 and a 3? Well, the 42, 42 is 7 times 6, so the 42 and the 7 would be a 6. 6 is 3 times 2, so the 6 and the 3 would give a 2. So a 42, a 7, and a 3 would have given us a 2. So that's how that trick can be used sometimes to make some calculations in multiple choice problems on the AP exam very fast. It's a trick uh, that I hope you'll practice occasionally. What about the potential difference across each capacitor? Well, we know that the equivalent capacitance is given by 2 microfarads. So that means that the charge on each capacitor, which is the same for reasons that we already talked about, is equal to the equivalent capacitance times the potential difference of the circuit. So 2 microfarads times 6 volts. So we get 12 microcoulombs for the charge on each capacitor. Well, now that we know the charge on each capacitor and we know the capacitance of each capacitor, which is different for each one, then we use that to figure out the potential difference. So charges are each 12 microcoulombs. Capacitance is charge per unit voltage. So voltage is charge over capacitance. So the potential difference, that is the voltage of capacitor 1, Q1 over C1. So 12 microcoulombs over 20 microfarads is 0.6 volts. Doing that for capacitor 2 gives you 2.4 volts, and doing that for capacitor 3 and its capacitance gives you 3 volts. So that's how you get the charge on each capacitor in series and the potential difference across each capacitor. Now in parallel, the potential differences will all be the same, but the charges would be different. In series, 
the charges are all the same, but the potential differences are different. And again, notice what's going on here. In this case, remember that higher capacitances mean you'll store more charge per unit voltage, but the charges are all the same. It's just that the capacitors that have higher capacitance end up storing um, the same amount of charge, but over less voltage. The 20 microfarad capacitor head is the largest capacitor in here, but it has the least potential difference across it. So let's take a look at more complex setups. Let's consider situations where some parts of the circuit are in series and some parts are in parallel. This will give us a good warm up for when we actually study circuits in more detail in the next unit. So how about a situation where we have our six volt capacitor here and then there's stuff. Well, what is the stuff? Well, part of the stuff is an arm that has a 20 and a five that are in series. The other part of the arm is just a four volt, or sorry, a four microfarad capacitor. So all units here are in microfarads. Well, you can do a quick mental trick. The 20 and the five in series gives you a four, but then you do four plus four, which would give you eight microfarads for your equivalent capacitance. Let's go through that in a little bit more detail. So when solving these, it does well to keep in mind that the charge on the equivalent capacitor, which is obtained by multiplying the equivalent capacitance times the EMF voltage, is equal to the charge of each series element. So in other words, that 20 and 5 microfarad capacitor, those two each have the same charge. Different potential differences, but the same charge. But the potential difference across, the total potential difference across the 20 and the 5 is going to be the same as the potential difference across the 4 microfarad capacitor. And if the total charge in the circuit is found to be, say, like 24 microcoulombs, when, by, when you multiply the equivalent capacitance times the EMF of the circuit, then if the circuit is composed of capacitor in series with two parallel capacitors, then the one in series has a charge of 24 microcoulombs, and the total charge of the two in parallel is 24 microcoulombs if um, each route had the same equivalent capacitance uh, along, along those arms because they would have the same potential difference and assuming they had the same equivalent capacitance each arm would end up having the same charge. But in our example that's not the case. So let's see how that works here. Here again we're going to break this into two parts. We have a part that's in series with each other and then the whole thing is in parallel. So we're going to consider first writing our givens and let just the C sub A, that is the capacitance of part A, be the equivalent capacitance down the middle. In other words, this arm right here. And then we're going to realize that okay this arm right here that has a, an equivalent capacitance of C sub A, that's in parallel with my 4 microfarad capacitor. So there's my C sub A. C sub A is what we call the equivalent capacitance of that arm that is more complicated. In this case, it's composed of two capacitors in series. Well, what is C sub A? We could do the mental trick, a 20 and a 5 in series. That's 1 over 20 plus 1 over 5 is 1 over 4. And the math confirms that. So the equivalent capacitance of arm A, so to speak, is 4 microfarads. And then that tells us also that the potential difference across capacitor 3, the 4 microfarad, it's, it's just all on its own. That's got to be 6 volts. And the total potential difference across arm A is also 6 volts. But what's going on in arm A? So first, just doing the easy calculation, getting that out of the way, the charge on the 4 microfarad capacitor, Q equals C delta V, is 4 microfarads times 6 volts, so that's going to be 24 microcoulombs. What about on arm A? Well, the potential difference across arm A is 6 volts, Kirchhoff's loop rule, which means that the charge on each capacitor there is equal to the same thing because they're in series, and that's going to be 24 microcoulombs for the whole arm, and therefore 24 microcoulombs for each uh, capacitor that makes up A. 
Okay. So we have that. And by the way, the equivalent capacitance of this whole thing is going to turn out to be uh, two, or sorry, eight microfarads because we would just add the things together, but we'll see how that works out. So the net voltage drop across arm A is six volts, but the capacitance is of capacitor one is charge over voltage one. So that voltage is charge the charge that it has stored that we just calculated divided by its capacitance. So that's 1.2 volts. So apparently the other 4.8 volts must be on capacitor 2. And that is indeed what we find mathematically. So we could have gotten that by subtracting off of the 6 volts or just by calculating it separately. So that's how you can find the not just the equivalent capacitance of things that are in what we call these hybrid circuits, but also how to break them apart and find the charge and potential difference on each capacitor. Now, these capacitors are storing charge, and when they release the charge, that charge has the potential to do work. Well, that means there's energy in it. Well, where is the energy stored? The energy is stored in the electric field. In other words, in the area between the two capacitor plates. So right now I'll just give you these two equations for the electric potential energy stored by a capacitor. Um, if you know the charge that it has and its capacitance, then the energy stored is just Q squared over 2C. If you know the potential difference instead of the charge, and you still know its capacitance, then the energy is 1 half CV squared or 1 half C delta V squared if you prefer, but most people just think of it as 1 half CV squared because the delta gets annoying in that. And you could also realize by some other just quick algebra that if you know the charge and the potential difference, but for some strange reason you don't know the capacitance, then the energy is 1 half Q delta V to the first power. So these arise from the fact that it takes a little bit of energy du equals QD delta V, or DQ delta V, where delta V is the fixed electric potential difference between the two plates. Um, the little bitty Q is the amount of charge that you're trying to move from one plate to the other. Well, that potential difference between the plates is equal to whatever charge is on them divided by the capacitance, just using the definition of capacitance. So there's your equation for the amount of energy necessary to move a little bitty charge from one plate of a capacitor to the other. So what you can do is you can integrate this equation starting from a charge of zero all the way up to a charge of your total charge big Q. So there we go, a kindergarten integral. So just integral of Q dQ is one half Q squared evaluated from Q equals zero to big Q. And so there's your formula for the potential energy difference that occurred by charging it and therefore the amount of energy that is stored in the capacitor. And usually we drop that delta just to say that, hey, this is the energy that's stored in the capacitor. And then from that, you can substitute Q equals CV to solve and get U equals one half CV squared and a similar type of thing to get the U equals one half QV. So these results should be memorized. Now, capacitors can be thought of as springs. Just thinking back to that last example, as the charge gets greater and greater on the capacitor, that Q that ends up being in the integral ends up being larger and larger, which is why we, we had to put it inside the integral, because it's changing. So it's kind of like compressing a spring. The more charge you add, the harder it is to add it, and therefore the more the energy is that's in there. In fact, you can kind of see that in there. Remember the potential energy of a spring, 1 half kx squared, where x is the compression distance? Well, here we have a 1 half q squared, and then the equivalent of our spring constant is the inverse of the capacitance. A stiff spring has a high value of k. A stiff capacitor has a low value of c, meaning that it's harder. Remember, low value of c means that it doesn't store as much charge per unit voltage, so it's harder to store the charge with a low value of charge storage capacity. 
So yeah, capacitors do act like, like springs in this sense. So another little analogy here is that the slow charging of a capacitor, like say through a battery, and then its quick discharge, is somewhat analogous to the slow gathering of potential energy when you're stretching a catapult that has a big boulder in it uh, back in Middle Age warfare, and then the quick energy transfer as that catapult is released. Well, also springs have a maximum amount by which they can be stretched. Obviously a maximum amount by which they can be compressed. You can't compress them so that they have zero size, but also a maximum amount by which they would be stretched. If you try stretching them much beyond that, then they will break. Well, the same thing goes with capacitors. If you try to exceed the maximum voltage rating, there will end up being dielectric breakdown in the capacitor, and basically it's going to end up shorting out, and then it won't be able to be used anymore. That's the magic blue smoke that I referenced already. So there are a lot of analogies between mechanics and electricity that should be kept in mind, and they, they often help us to better understand what's going on. Now, as I mentioned, the energy that's stored in the capacitor is stored um, in the space between the plates themselves. Um, in other words, ju just in the vacuum. So the energy comes directly from the electric field. So how much energy is stored in the electric field? It turns out that the amount of energy, at least the density in which the energy is stored, is directly proportional to the square of the electric field itself. This is a general statement that you should memorize. One half epsilon naught e squared is the overall formula. So you can obtain it for a parallel plate capacitor by considering the fact that the capacitance is equal to epsilon naught a over d. Hopefully you haven't forgotten that formula, capacitance of parallel plate capacitor, epsilon naught a over d. And the electric potential difference is just E times D, where D is the separation distance between the plates, and E is the electric field string. Yeah, don't confuse capital E here with energy. Um, so, but yeah, this is one half epsilon naught energy, or sorry, one half epsilon naught times electric field strength squared. So, in any case, the energy stored in capacitor, we just got that that's one half CV squared, but V equals Z, or delta V equals Z, so we plug that in there, we square it, and one factor of d goes away, but we still have another factor of d. So here's our expression now for the electric potential energy stored in a capacitor in terms of the electric field strength. But the whole point here is that this factor in parentheses, this a times d, what is that? That's the volume of the space between the capacitor plates. And it's that volume that has the electric field of strength e. So how about we just divide out that volume and get a general formula for the energy density of uh, space. The energy density of space is equal to one half epsilon naught e squared, where e is the electric field strength, epsilon naught is the permittivity of free space, and well, one half is one half, half of one. Yeah, you know that. So in any case, this shows that the that the vacuum itself stores energy in accordance with the strength of the electric field. As we will discover in a later unit, it also stores energy in accordance with the strength of a magnetic field as well through a similar formula. But in any case, this result would have been arrived at no matter what kind of capacitor we used. Um, so just considering the parallel plate situation, um, was one convenient way of getting it, but no matter how we did it, we would still get that the energy density of space when there's an electric field is one half epsilon naught e squared. Now, what about this epsilon naught? Why is there a naught subscript there? It's the permittivity of free space, but different materials have different permittivities, different ways in which the electric field is able to propagate due to the way that the electric field causes atoms and molecules in the material to align and get polarized. As a result, this leads to the concept of dielectrics, things that we can place between plates and capacitors, and we will examine these in more detail in the next video. I'll see you then. Thank you for watching.